Hi, and welcome back to the challenge. We're now at week 11, so steadily counting down. And uh, you've done now a complete take of the Schumann Scherzo and gotten your feet wet with that. And this week we're going to take a look at Don Juan, which is perhaps the most famous, the most requested excerpt, that and the Schumann Scherzo together. Um, and I often think that it inspires fear somehow just because of its name. I feel like if it were called something else, I don't know, Don Albert or something, it, uh, it wouldn't seem as scary to, to play. And it doesn't have to be scary. It's a great opportunity to, to show off. And it just takes some, it takes a plan, <laughs> like a lot of Strauss. Um, some excerpts you can kind of just have a feel for them and, and play them. And something like this, there are so many parts that go into it, um, so many components, that you need a plan. And of course it takes practice. But what I want to impress upon you, and the reason that I had um, you work on your first impression with this, uh, this past week, is that all of the parts come together when they're well planned, and then when they're actually assembled in the practice room. Uh, one of the mistakes that I made with some of my earlier auditions was working on the parts, getting them the way I wanted, and then trusting that they would come together um, close to the end. And I neglected <laughs> to put them together comfortably. And so what happened was that in the end they came together but with a lot of tension built in because I hadn't left enough time to let it marinate or let the parts fuse a little bit. So what am I talking about? Uh, you already saw from your first impression video last week that it um, can be tough to get off the ground in this one. It's such an unconventional opening with an empty, empty downbeat. Um, so let's, let's look at that first bar. Um, the nice thing about this is that unlike some other excerpts, for example, the Schumann, where you have to set a tempo right away, <laughs> you know, if, if you're not steady right from the start, everyone's going to know it. With Don Juan, you have a little leeway because really nobody's going to be sure what your tempo is until... <laughs> so that's the part where you're really saying, okay, this is my tempo. I mean, it's great if all of those opening notes fall into that, but what's more important is getting some sound and getting that right spirit. Um, I do, I used to play everything in first position in the beginning. Now I do like to shift. Um, I like the bowing pattern that way a little better, string crossing pattern. Um, I play this in the upper half of the bow, middle to upper half. Um, here's about where I start. And as with everything, I start from the string. And I like to think of four notes. Um, it's amazing how many people I see try to kind of, you know, <laughs> get a start from off the string or without it being set. The G string is the open G string. That's a thick string that needs to be almost plucked with the bow. And then you keep the bow in the string for those notes. I don't like to have a big break in between the bars. I think that figure goes all the way to the top. Um, I've been asked sometimes to put articulation, but I don't prefer it. Uh, when I played this with Chicago Symphony, we would just take it right to the top. Very exciting. Um, I have a little visual cue if I want to find an octave above the open E string. I know where that is visually on my instrument. It's just about at the point where I'm, I'm looking for that point where the neck meets the rib the way I hold the instrument, right about at that point for me is an octave above the E string. Um, so 
I move my finger right to that spot. First finger. And then it's easy. I, uh, takes away some tension about that shift. These next triplets are often rushed and, and uneven. So those are ones to practice with dotted rhythms if you like. Um, just make sure that there's sound on all the notes. If, if you can hear the notes as they're going by, then you're, you're on the right track. Um, so for years, with those two chords, um, you know, violinists have all, we, we've had it drummed into our heads, you know, the first one's a quarter, the second one's an eighth, so, so much of the time in auditions now, we hear like, and it just, <laughs> not a good sound. They, they are different lengths, but, yeah, da 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 yeah, it doesn't need to be exaggerated. And they both can have ample bow and little vibrato there. Um, <coughs> to start the next passage, I put my hand in third position for the C sharp. And I simply reach my one back a little bit for the G sharp. I don't want to be shifting, or not that you'd shift like that, but why bother? Ooh. Have you guys figured out how to make your E string whistle yet? Um, hopefully, if you can make it happen, then it won't happen uh, when you don't want. I go up on a one there. Again. For a, for a shift in the moment like that, I'm not using my visual cue. That's just, I'm listening and feeling. A word about bowings in this. Um, follow them as you can, but because, you know, that was the comp Strauss's idea of phrasing and articulation, you can't play it literally as it's printed. It's, it, it doesn't work out quite right. So some people split here. That puts the strong beats on down bows, but there's a big danger of really accenting that up bow. So I prefer to leave that slur as it is. I split here. And I do not shift back for that F natural. I find it's much more accurate for me to reach back with the first finger. So I don't move my hand until I play in that note. Here, you do come back in dynamic but it shouldn't be, you know, it's still an exciting passage and, and you're accompanying some loud, rather loud instruments. So it doesn't have to, you know, exaggerate. And <clears throat> not the world's biggest crescendo at the end. Just get a little bit more on the string at the end. There's a lot of finishing notes up high in this piece, <coughs> and the priority on them should be sound quality. Um, so it's useful, and we'll talk about this with the big run that's halfway down the page. Um, it's useful to practice all of these in isolation, just getting your sound quality. For example, this last one. Slowly, then in tempo. So I'm after my finger solidly going down on the string. I'm after my bow staying in position and staying on task. I don't want the bow doing and, you know, really running away with me. That's one of the biggest mistakes you can make way up high on the E string is to try and move the bow too fast. The string is just too short at that point. Uh. 
these we play on, and there too, listen for sound on all the notes. There's even room for a shape, imagine that. <laughs> kind of follow the line. Here I start in fourth position. And there are a couple times where I do a 2-2. Two, two. Did you notice I left my one down for all of that? I've seen a lot of fingerings over the years that involve a lot of shifting around, but you can leave that one down the whole time, just moving it over a string now and then. It's even still there in fourth position. Now, and um, <clears throat> okay, here's where everyone's heart races and um, what you want to do here is hear every note, and that starts with the very first time you practice it in the practice room. You're after quality. So if I'm practicing it slowly, I want to practice it in a rhythm, and I want to hear all the notes, and I want it to feel nice and free. That may be quite uh, free, not in rhythm, but free from tension. That may require a very slow tempo, and that's fine. I want to be beautiful. There are little checkpoints along the way. You can make use of those. Um, I might like it even more beautiful than that, <laughs> come to think of it. Um, but the point is that you play the tempo that's comfortable so that you can play all the notes. So many people get wound up and they, they never once play this well in any tempo. <laughs> My fingering. Here I go to fourth position again. I like fourth. My three needs to cover both strings when it goes down. finish one, two, three, you can do what's comfortable for you. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip just a little bit to the, um, well, I'm skipping ahead too quickly. Move the tempo up gradually. That's the point. When you make your take of this this week, you can play it at whatever tempo is comfortable. I like to, when the 16th notes start, I imagine that I slow down just a little bit. Um, nobody in on the panel, nobody in the audience could notice it. But for myself, I think I really want to feel those. So even when I play it in tempo, I think that doesn't really come out that way. Uh, again, it's quality at the top. I like to practice even just the last note. Add one note, and add another note. I do that pretty much in tempo. That's a great way to get used to sounding great on the top, which a lot of people, they never get that feeling. Um, just quickly, these quiet notes at the end. Finish in the part of the bow that's going to bounce. Start all those from the string. Close to the string, but a little bit off. And now after all this talking, um, I don't know if it's wise to do a take of, um, of the Don Juan, but we will see what comes out. And um, we'll give you an idea how to put the, the parts together. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, aside from some uh, squeaking E strings, since I mentioned it earlier, of course that was bound to happen. Um, there's your Don Juan. So I look forward to seeing your videos from week 11. Thanks so much. <laughs>